in the WRS program as well. I teach hydrogeology for WRS. So I may have got it in. Um, so as we get set up here, uh, I probably have too many slides. This is a typical professor problem. So I'm going to go pretty quickly here once I get going. Maybe. <laughs> yep, I just want to hide. Uh, folks online, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, I can. Stay right there. If you move forward, we can't hear you. Okay, I'll stay relatively stationary. All right. So, title of the talk, you can read for yourself. But uh, big, there it is, our beautiful, iconic landmark, um, in all of its glory, uh, almost all of its glory. And <clears throat> we're going to talk about this today. So, a couple points I want to get down right away. Uh oh. I'm, I'm trying. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. So first and foremost, Minnesota Point, Wisconsin Point, Park Point, whatever you want to call it, is a net sink for sand and gravel, coarse grain sediment. It's where sediment in Lake Superior and the surrounding area basically goes to die. Um, and Oh. Fix it, Jay. Make it go away. I don't. So how far? Ah, oh, there we go. I would like to add that Jay and I have a combined age of approximately one hundred years. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's get off of that. <laughs> so uh, before I forget, some collaborators, um, just in case I don't give credit where credit is properly due. Uh, Andy, who's here actually. Uh, Andy and Harry are my uh, Wisconsin colleagues who work together on various aspects of this, and someday we'll actually publish these results. Um, Karen Grant is my departmental colleague. She works mainly on rivers. Um, she's always trying to drag me up rivers. I'm always trying to drag her down to the coast. And this grumpy British guy right here does um, your physical work for another semester or so before he retires. And then some students that are current and past. And then moving on. So get a little bit of uh, bookkeeping out of the way. Um, what is Minnesota Point? Is it a sandbar? Is it a spit? Is it a bay milk bar? Do we really care? Um, I think the best way to describe it, and this is what I'm going to use, is I'm going to call it a barrier. You can call it a barrier complex or a barrier island. Um, pick your poison. The main reason to do that is to uh, open access to the vast literature and understanding that we have of barrier systems on our salty coastlines. And in doing so, we sort of um, remove some of the um, mystery about Minnesota Point. It's actually a fairly straightforward system. And what I've done here is just compare it to uh, Galveston Bay. So I've taken our neck of the woods and rotated it a little bit. And just to make the point that fundamentally, you know, a barrier separates an estuary from an open body of water. In our case, it's Lake Superior, here's the Gulf of Mexico. And in order to get a barrier, we need to have basically two things. We need to have a rise in lake level or sea level, that's one component. And then we need to have a supply of sediment, sand or gravel. Okay. So we're gonna to touch on a few of these things today. Um, but just looking forward, most of this talk is going to be, well, there's going to be about a third of it science, a third of it narrative set up of the problem, and then a third of it um, some crazy ideas maybe that I've had. All right. So before moving on, let's just bear in the back of our minds that for their size, barrier systems, barrier islands are some of the most dynamic landforms on earth. They are very ephemeral. They come and go relatively quickly on geologic time scale. So here's an example of the Chandelier Islands off of the Mississippi Delta. This is a classic barrier island system. This is before Katrina. This is one year after Katrina. So they can come and go. Um, now this might heal itself a little bit moving forward, or it might be signaling the end of the Chandelier Islands. Uh, just about a year ago at this time, we were watching Hurricane Ian 
setting its uh, sights on coastal Florida. And basically, we got to observe in real time the damage it can do to a barrier system that being Captiva Island. So always remember that barriers are very ephemeral features. Okay, so my goals overall here are going to be to discuss and critique what are known as Section 111 studies. I will fill in some of the gory details on that in a minute. And along as part of that process, we're going to spend some time doing some science, looking over basically how Minnesota Point works. I'm going to focus mostly on the modern or relatively recent past and less on what I personally consider to be a very interesting problem, that being the genesis of Minnesota Point, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. And then right at the end, I'll just propose a kind of harebrained idea to maybe get at some of the uh, intractable nature of this system. So very brief history of Minnesota, Wisconsin Point. This, we actually are in a very, well, it's a, it's a very beneficial um, uh, arrangement where we have very good data describing the initial conditions of Minnesota Point before humans really began messing around with it. So this is the 1861 need map, which it's difficult to read anything from anywhere in the room here, but all these little numbers in here, or the, all these little symbols that you might see, these little uh, look like dead insects, those are actually bathymetric, they're soundings. There, there are numbers indicating water depth, and then there's some more information about the grain size of sediments down there. So in the uh, Civil War time period, um, Herding, you may have heard of Herding Island, conducted this amazing survey, apparently had a lot of spare time to work on this, and mapped out very, very carefully the bathymetry of the, um, of the point and the estuary. So Andy and his students took that map and essentially digitized it and that is this figure right here so there is the modern barrier this is 1861 ish okay and then the color coding is bathymetry the warmer colors are shallow the cooler colors are deeper i just want to draw your eye to a few features here first and foremost let's start down here in the, in the lower end we have the Nemagi River. Anybody who's driven all the way through Superior, Wisconsin, out the other end has crossed over the Nemagi. The Nemagi is a relatively large river and a relatively high producer of sediment. In 1861, it was still trying to stick its head out into the lake, but it was in the process of being drowned. Today, it can't even quite get there because any effort it makes to um, fill in that space gets removed because it's in the way of shipping. So in 1861, the natural inlet, the feature that allowed exchange of fluid between the lake and the estuary was right here. And it's not a coincidence that it's um, positioned off in Imagi. Uh, and then here, you can see the trace of the St. Louis River channel. And this channel trace is cut down into what we think is a series of old sandy beach ridges that in a way probably represent earlier versions of the older versions of the modern barrier. Okay. And then if you squint here quick a bit, you can see some linear, some lineations. Those, again, are probably the bathymetric signature of what are called strand planes or old beach ridges. So there's a, there's a long history of this system building out into the lake through time. And we'll come back to that a little bit in the future, but not or in this talk, but not too much. All right, so that was 1861. By 1867, humans had started to build the jetties and then subsequent to that, the breakwaters at the superior entry. So down here in the Southeast, a few years later, city of the, the, the sort of nascent city of Duluth started building the Duluth entry. So here's an 1870 photo from the Duluth hillside. And you can see just the beginnings of the jetties and the Duluth Harbor. And then by 1898, they're better established. So let's talk about the intractable 
situation. First ingredient, shipping. Those jetties allowed access to the estuary, what we call today the harbor. And that has triggered an immense, immensely positive and beneficial economic impact to the area. These numbers should basically say it all, right? This is basically one of the biggest economic drivers in our area. So its importance cannot be overstated. So all the things I'm gonna tell you about moving on from here, in the back of your mind, you may be thinking, why don't we just take some things out and get rid of the harbor? And that's of course never going to happen, nor should it. So that's ingredient one. Ingredient two is sediment transport. So if you open up any introductory earth science book and you look in the coastal chapter, you're going to see an image somewhat like this, or perhaps like this, depending on how fancy the graphics are. I can interrupt. You, no, that's fine. Can you, um, the people online can't see your laser pointer. Um, so yes. think about, yes, I know, technology. Yay. So just <laughs> like like the figure in the upper right corner. Ah, here we go. In the, yeah, correct. Okay. So um, the main thing we need to take away from this these images here today is the idea of longshore transport or littoral drift. It also has some other names. And that's the idea that during a, a coastal storm, when you have a good wave field, um, the angle those waves make with the coastline and the height of those waves will control, will mobilize sediment and move it along the shoreline. So a very crude rule of thumb is if you have any impediments in the way of that river of sediment, you're going to drive accretion or deposition on the updrift or upstream side of that and erosion on the downstream side of that. So coastal scientists have understood this process for well over a century in, in quite a bit of detail. And as you might imagine, that's going to come into play today. All right. So what is the intractable situation or seemingly intractable situation? It's this. Basically, we have a need for jetties and piers to allow access to our harbor. That's just undeniable. It's not going away. Superimposed on that, we have the basic problem that those jetties interrupt the flow of sediment. And we have two points of interruption. We have the Duluth Ship Canal up here, and we have the Superior Entry down here. And as I'll lay out in the next few slides, those two piers are interrupting sediment that is moving along the North Shore towards the point and along the South Shore towards the point. This, again, this Minnesota point is where sediments go. It's a net depositional feature for what is otherwise a net erosional environment all around us. So this is where sediments go to go to live. And they will live there, they will be sequestered there for thousands of years into the future. Okay. So a couple of observations. Um, immediately after the construction of the federal structures, that's a new term, federal structures is just a fancy way of saying the Duluth Ship Canal and the Superior Entry. Immediately after they were built, we started to see perturbations to the shoreline. And those perturbations have persisted for the entire lifespan of those features. They are most obvious and they draw the most public attention when lake levels are relatively high. Because during those time periods, wave energy can attack the soft coastline that is Minnesota Point more effectively and create a more uh, in your face kind of problem. But the bigger issue is ongoing in the background all the time. Okay, it's just very apparent during periods of high lake level. So here's a kind of clunky image I threw together um, showing basically the overlaying the 2017 Google Earth image onto a 1938 air photo. This is the superior entry. And it's a little bit hard to tease out here, but the obviously the, the gray non-color stuff is the 1938 imagery. And if you follow that coastline down right to here, you'll see that there's an abrupt break because on the 
down drift side of the superior entry, we've had almost 90 meters of erosion in the last 80 years. On the up drift side, so we're down here to the southeast, the sediment supply coming over along the south coast gets essentially trapped here on that breakwater and deposited. So we've had essentially the same amount of deposition driving the coastline shoreline forward, lakeward over there as we've had erosion on this side. This effect is very obvious at the south entry, this, this is sometimes called the south end. So you'll hear me say that at the superior entry because relatively little has been done to modify that. So we can see the long-term effects of it. There have been some, uh, some things done, which I'll discuss briefly later, but for the most part, it's, it's relatively clear to see. Okay, so let's get down to section 111 stuff. One of the issues at play here is to determine culpability. And the idea here is, is the U.S. Corps of Engineers, which maintains these structures, to what extent are they responsible for any deleterious effects on the on Minnesota Point, on the coastline? Here's a uh, relatively recent article in the paper. And if we look down there in March of 2021, so a little over two years ago, um, now outgoing Mayor Larson asked the Corps of Engineers to conduct a study to ascertain to what extent those federal structures are um, responsible for the problems we see on Minnesota Point. So what is a section 111 study? Really quickly, it is the Corps of Engineers going to a location, conducting a very thorough field study, modeling study, and trying to determine and quantify what effect their structures are having on the coastline. And depending on their findings, there is a certain amount of money available to remedy the situation. That's a gross simplification of it, but probably good enough for now, right? So the core of a couple of points, the Corps of Engineers performs the study, they analyze the results and they determine their culpability, if any. 2024, next year, will mark the golden anniversary of the first Section 111 study, which took place in 1974. And in between, it's, and by the way, there is a, there, there's a current study ongoing now. So we have three, one in 1974, one in 1998, 2001, and then the ongoing. And maybe this third time will be the charm, so to speak. So um, <clears throat> I think it's helpful to place the Section 111 studies that have taken place and that is taking place in the context of short-term Sea, or lake level changes in and around, well, in Duluth. Yeah. So this is a 60 year, the upper panel here is a 60 year hydrograph, that's the lake level uh, at Duluth. And you can see that basically the previous 111 studies and the current 111 studies correlate strongly with, they lag slightly, but they correlate strongly with periods of high lake level. So one thought might be high lake level and associated erosion triggered a response from the public that then resulted in a section 111 study, right? Um, one thing to keep in mind, and this will be important uh, later, is that these fluctuations in lake level, which if you look at the magnitude, you have about three feet or one meter-ish of total play there. These are driven by short-term by short term, I mean decadal scale fluctuations in climate. So these are climate driven fluctuations. Right? They are, those climate driven fluctuations are superimposed on a long term rise in lake level in the Western Arm of Lake Superior that is driven by processes down in the Earth's mantle. So it's the result of ice sheets melting and stress being taken off the Earth's surface and the lithosphere rebounding through time, which is gonna turn out to be very important here. Uh, it actually drives everything that's happening around us. So in the meantime, 
what's been going on to address the intractable problem? Primarily, it's been beach nourishment. Basically, from the moment those federal structures were in place, so 1870-ish onward, there's periodically been deposition of sediment, both to put dredge spoils from the harbor somewhere, but then also to mitigate some of the effects of erosion. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of these events. There was a large nourishment in 1934. I blocked that out here in, in yellow in the lower panel. So that is deposition or uh, dredge spoil and placement just downstream of the Duluth jetties. So if we were to go back to our textbook of longshore drift and its effect on sediment transport, or sorry, the effect of piers on longshore transport, we would expect this to be an area that would be an area of erosion and we would need to nourish it. So 1934, it was nourished. 1963, there was a huge nourishment and almost 2 million cubic meters of sediment deposited, again, downstream of the uh, south pier of the Duluth Harbor, Duluth Entry. And then in 2020 to 2021, there was another uh, large nourishment event. There have been other smaller nourishments along the way here. I'm just highlighting three of them. So here's some nice air photos from the Corps of Engineers illustrating the beach nourishment. What's happening here is basically sediments are being taken out of the harbor and moved across the point and deposited here on the lakeward side and then reworked with earth moving equipment. The idea being that the beach is then built out and um, that helps to mitigate some of the effects of erosion. There are some problems with beach nourishment. In particular, the sediments that come out of the harbor are significantly finer grained than are the lakeward sort of native sediments. And because of their fine grained nature, they're, they're more mobile. In particular, they are mobile in the wind. So this is a photograph taken by a resident that lives with, you just barely see the, the lift bridge right there. So he's a little bit um, south of the lift bridge. And this dune has formed in adjacent to his backyard since nourishment in 2021. Um, also, not only is that material very mobile in the wind, it's very mobile in the near shore. So here's a photograph from autumn of 2020, right after some nourishment was done, you'll notice the shoreline is out to the uh, this little concrete wall right here. Here it is the next spring. That's the same concrete wall. And you can see that there's been a significant amount of growth. Where's the sediment going? It's going this direction. If you ever get a chance, this is just a little digression, but if you get a chance to come down and walk on this material, you walk on it, you'll notice that it's very firm. It doesn't sort of play around your feet like typical coarse grain sand does. The reason it does that is it has a lot of silt and even some finer grain sediment in it that gives it some strength. That's also why it forms these small erosional escarpments when it gets attacked by waves. Nonetheless, this is uh, sort of what we're doing right now to address and help to mitigate uh, erosion on the point. Okay, let's look at the let's look at some twenty uh, some section one eleven studies if I can speak. Sorry. So let's look first at the nineteen seventy four study, um, and obviously we're not going to go through all hundred so pages of it, but the, the conclusions are basically stated right here. The main conclusion is that the federal structures have created a potential erosion problem down drift of the north end of the loop piers. But the Corps of Engineers concluded that no actual damage had been done to the point and therefore they recommended no action. Okay, That's the primary conclusion of the 74 study. And their rationale can be summarized in this slide which goes something like this. The 1964 shoreline as measured is actually located lakeward of the original 1861 shoreline. So therefore, there isn't any loss of shoreline and there's no problem. I'll let that sink in for a second. 
to which I have the following thought problem posed to you. All right. So moving on to the 1998 to 2001 Section 111 study, what were the overarching conclusions of that? Continue to uh, state that there was no north end damage, so no remedy there. The Corps did take essentially full responsibility for the damage at the south end. So the, the large erosion that I showed you in that overlay of air photos. However, and this is a perennial problem, the cost to remedy the situation exceeded basically the, the amount of money available from the federal end and the city did not have the resources to make up the difference. That's a simplified explanation. So as a result, no action was taken. Now, here we're gonna do a little bit of science. Okay, um, the results of this study are important because they basically set the framework for the ongoing study, the current study. So let's um, let's critique those a little bit. So much of the 2001 study, the conclusions were based on modeling work done by an external consultant, Baird. And this is a fairly common approach at the core. They're they're doing the same thing in the ongoing, the current study. They are. Uh, outsourcing the modeling, the development of a very complicated hydrodynamic model of sediment transport to a third party. The 1998 study, um, after reviewing it, I kind of had five issues with it, and I'm going to outline those here today. So the 1988, 1998 study indicated that there was about 50,000 cubic meters per year of sediment, sand, coming from the north, or from, sorry, from the south shore uh, area. And that that 50,000 cubic meters was basically, um, some of it was being trapped upstream by the superior breakwaters, but then a, an equal amount was being eroded on the downdrift side and being transported northwestward all the way along the Lincoln Point. And the study also indicated there would be an offshore transfer of that sediment. I'll show you this in a figure in just a second. Their work ignored the effects of long-term lake level rise, that glacial rebound process that I mentioned a minute ago, and I think that's very important. And I'll show you some calculations for that in a minute. And then finally, that study ignored the input of sediment from the north shore, so from our side of the lake, so to speak. So let's pick those apart a little bit. There is a image from their study that's hard to interpret, but basically there's the Duluth entry for comparison. The big red, big red arrows are sediment supply. I'm gonna, I'm gonna synthesize this in the following figure. It's a little easier to see. So my objections, if I can do this, are that I think that sediment supply is too big. I think that's overall incorrect. I very much think that's incorrect. I think that's incorrect. And I think that's incorrect. I don't. <laughs> All right. And I'm, yeah, okay. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about some relevant sediment dynamics here. And to understand this, let's remind ourselves that barriers, their formation, their existence, their fate depends on a delicate balance between the lake, the rate of lake level rise and the rate of sediment supply. So I wanna highlight two features here with respect to this. The first is gonna be the issue of long-term lake level rise in the Duluth area, what's been on the lake superior. I'm gonna lean heavily on some work done by Andy right here, but basically, and others, but basically for the last thousand years, 1100, 1200 years, in our neck of the woods, lake level has been rising with respect to bedrock at a rate of about two and a half to three millimeters a year. In other words, if you stood up on Hawk Ridge for a very long time and watched the lake level, it would come, it would be coming up at a, essentially a steady rate. Superimposed on that are all the seasonal fluctuations and the decadal fluctuations. This is a long-term lake level rise. Okay? Before that lake level was falling, we don't need to worry about that right now. And basically, I think most of us that study this system think that. Minnesota Point, as we see it today, started to look like it looks today about 1,200 years ago. Okay? 
So real quickly, this is the time period that we're interested in where modern lake level is rising at two and a half to three millimeters per year. Why does it do that? It does that because with the current outlet of Lake Superior, Sault Ste. Marie, you can imagine Lake Superior as a bowl. Okay, and You're holding that bowl and you're tilting it with time while you're feeding water into it and water's draining out in the midpoint there. See the midpoint drainage? So if you're on one end of the bowl, you see the level in the bowl dropping. So you see a lake level uh, fall, sorry. If you're down where we are in the southwestern end of the lake, you see a lake level rise. And this is all driven by processes in the mantle as the asthenosphere tries to flow in and fill space it's left behind by melting of the ice sheets, kind of like your sits mark on a waterbed after you get up and watch it fill in if you're bored. <laughs> All right, so we can move on from that. Um, so we have this long-term lake level rise. The other thing we need to worry about is long-term sediment supply. Remember I said back in one of the first slides, barriers are sediment supply and lake level rise. So let's do this one. In summary, there are two sources of sediment for Minnesota Point today. Those two sources are riverine input along the North Shore, riverine input along the South Shore, which then gets carried down to Minnesota Point by long shore currents. The second source of sediment is bluff retreat. So the North Shore and the South Shore, if you particularly on the South Shore, if you've ever visited just east of Superior, you'll be standing on top of a 15 meter high bluff that is retreating at about half a meter a year. Where does that material go? It goes in the lake. Most of it's mud, but there is a sand component to it. Where does the sand component go? To Duluth. Similar story on the North Shore, but the bluff is retreating at a lower rate. Okay. So real quick calculations I, I and my students have done suggest that the North Shore sediment supply is about 8,000 cubic meters per year. The South Shore is about 25,000. Okay. So we're going to kind of motor through this because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. But basically what you're looking at here is the my crude attempt to show the input of sediment from rivers along the South and North shores. Basically over the last thousand years, we should not have expected those numbers to change that much, maybe a little bit in the last 150 years due to land use changes, but those are relatively stable. One thing I will point out here is that um, the St. Louis and the Nemagi are, were historically significant sources of sediment for this neck of the woods, today, not so much because they're being drowned by lake rising lake flow. Okay. Um, I've done a lot of work trying to quantify uh, using simple, simple models how a lake level rise leads to a bluff retreat and that leads to a sediment supply. So here's a simple geometric model. That's the coast in front of my house. Basically, this bluff is retreating, this material is being dumped on the beach. That material is then remobilized by large storms and carried down towards the loop, okay? So if we look at the results of this model, you can ignore the three significant figures, just stick with one. <laughs> this is literally a bar napkin type calculation. On the North Shore around Duluth here, we're good for about five centimeters a year of bluff retreat with a considerable amount of variability because we have a lot of different bedrock lithologies present. So if we do some quick scaling analysis, we can come up with a North Shore sediment flux based on that. Don't put too much weight in that number, okay? We can do the same thing on the South Shore, apply the same geometric model. But here, the material that we're cutting into is a thick, unconsolidated package of glacial material. There's very little bedrock exposed until you go further east. So as a result, a given increment of long-term lake level rise allows that bluff to retreat significantly more. The average rates over here are about half a meter a year, rough number, okay? That house is in That house, yeah, it, I think they moved it. <laughs> or I hope they moved it. <laughs> uh, but you can see basically just this classic kind of slumping behavior. It's really, it's really beautiful unless you're living there. Um, so again, very, very gross numbers. Do a similar calculation. You come up with 
a South Shore sediment supply of 20 to 30,000 cubic meters per year with a fair amount of large error bar. It's a sediment transport, big, big error bars on everything, right? All right, how does that sediment, how and when does that sediment that we dump into the near shore move? It moves during cyclones. It moves during extra tropical or mid latitude cyclones. And in particular, it moves during these things, which are called Colorado lows or four corner lows. These are the big uh, storms we get in the fall, the winter, and the spring, where we have a low pressure system coming up from the four corners area. It's dragging warm Gulf of Mexico air and moisture with it. And as it approaches us on the front side of the cyclone, we initiate long fetch winds from the east northeast so those winds can run down the entire length of the lake and generate a very large wave field associated with them that wave field moves that sediment towards the loop so going back to one of my first slides you can see i hope pretty clearly here that everything eroded along here ends up being deposited here so minnesota point is an area of intense deposition historically as well it had input from the St. Louis River and the Nemaji River. But today, those are drowning and not so important anymore. So the sediment budget on the point is dominated by longshore transport along the coastline. OK, I want to go back. And now that we've had this sort of brief introduction to sediment dynamics, I want to tackle the uh, four or five objections I have with the 2001 study. So I'm going to try to do the first four in four slides. And I'm going to give you my, my take home messages here before I mess it all up in the subsequent slides. Okay. So my first, my four points here, I think that study overestimated the South Shore sediment supply. Why is that important? Because it implicitly downplays the North Shore sediment supply. And that has some very important implications for how the point, Minnesota point behaves. And we'll get to that, get back to that. I think Baird's prediction that there was this large offshore transfer of sand is not borne out by evidence. I think most of that sand that gets it, that makes its way along the coastlines to Minnesota Point actually is sequestered right on the point because the point is constantly battling that lake level rise. It's trying to keep its nostrils above water. So most of the sediment is used to do that. Any sediment left over is used to drive Minnesota Point forward, or at least it has historically. Okay. And this observation is very consistent with information we have. This is, G these are GPR data from Harry and his students. This is a transect across the point, so perpendicular to the shoreline. These features that you see here in green are the characteristic signature in the subsurface of a sedimentary body that is building lakeward. In other words, it's construction. This is where sediment goes to die. This is what it looks like when it dies. Okay. All right. So let's pick this apart a little bit. Now, I don't, that's the wrong term. It's so petty. I'm not trying to pick anything apart. I'm just trying to be a scientist here. So the estimates of South Shore sand supply. So Baird based their estimates on looking at different shorelines at different times. You see this little, this called a fillet of sand, sand part that's been deposited. They looked at that volume and came up with an annual yield. I had a student look at this in more detail, and her results suggested the number is about half of what Baird used. Again, this is sediment transport, so the error bars are huge. Um, but I feel more confident in this number. And this number, by the way, is also closer to some original estimates by the Corps back in the 1974 study. So take home message. I think the South Shore sediment supply used in the 2001 study is too big. What else? Two and three together. The Baird model has sediment discharge, again, fed by erosion here, moving straight down the point. And then you got to put that sediment somewhere, right? So in the Baird model, which does not treat deposition in the in sort of the long-term sense, this sediment has to go somewhere. Where do they send it? They send it offshore. Okay. So we should see, given the volumes of sediment involved here, we should see some sort of depositional feature in the offshore that's indicative of that sand being transferred there. We do not. 
at least based on these data. We may have some newer data that have not been shared yet with us, but based on older data, we do not see any feature out here that's supportive of that hypothesis. So um, I think that's incorrect. And I would suggest an easier explanation. So we're gonna, we're gonna drag out our Occam's razor here and go to work. There's a simpler explanation and that is the following. As I've already said, if those sediment fluxes come along the shore, they run up one from the north, one from the south, as they move along the point, they are depositing sediment, and eventually they get to a point where both fluxes are exhausted, and there's essentially a stagnation point there. Okay, this is a simpler model that is consistent with what we see in the subsurface data, suggesting that the point, this sort of point, is a constructional feature. All right, this is a complicated slide to walk through, so I'm going to go through it really, really quickly. Basically, what I did here is I did a simple mass balance where I took a control volume, I drew this between the uh, north end of the south pier, sorry, north end of the pier entry, and this hypothesized zero flux stagnation point that I think exists. And I looked at how much sediment would be needed to keep Minnesota Point's nostrils above water, okay? So to keep it from drowning. So how to do that, you basically, it's, it's simple. You look at the plan form area, the footprint, and you multiply it by the lake level rise rate, and you get essentially a discharge of sediment that needs to be dumped there, keep things as they are. If I do that exercise with some error bars on it, I get 15 to 18,000 cubic meters per year. Okay? Compare that to what we think is coming in, 25,000, and you can see that based on this calculation, most of the sediment coming from the South Shore is actually being used just to keep the point alive, so to speak. Any remainder you have is probably being used to drive the point forward. Again, it's a constructional feature. Okay, last thing, I'm, I'm gonna get done here, bear with me. Uh, the Baird model assumed that there is no sediment supply coming from the North Shore. I don't think that's right. I do wanna be clear that the majority of the sediment feeding Minnesota Point, I think does indeed come from the South Shore. But I don't think the amount coming from the North Shore is negligible or can be ignored. And that's important when we talk about culpability, because if there is a substantial sediment supply coming out the North Shore, then presumably the federal structure in the form of the Duluth Piers has interrupted that transport. Okay, so what are my lines of evidence? My first line of evidence is the original herding survey. So these are the little, so where are we? We are, uh, here's the Duluth entryway. Here's the 1861 version of that, no entryway yet. If you, it, probably the back can't read this, but stony, stony, gravel, gravel, a little more gravel, and then sand. The point here is that the point up here in the north is not composed of sand. It's composed of gravel and cobbles, right? What do those look like? Here's a picture from Gary Glass showing material being excavated off the point recently as part of a, some construction. Window in on that a little bit. You look at that material, what do you see? Rounded clasps of volcanic lithology. Those are beach cobbles. That looks the same as the material in front of my house. Okay? Indeed, Major Houston, in his original 1872 report, said the northern two miles of Minnesota Point was covered in gravel. So again, taking out Occam's razor, the easiest explanation for this is that the northern part of Minnesota Point is actually cored by sediment delivered from the North Shore, in particular, cobbles, gravel, and sand. We have other lines of evidence along the North Shore that provide, you know, that tell us about the, the sediment flux. You may recognize this area right here. That's Flensheen Mansion. If you've ever been down to the boathouse and the breakwater associated with it, there's a big wedge of sediment on the uptick side. All right. And then finally, I did a quick calculation based on, I did two quick calculations based on the data in the 1974 Section 111 study, which, by the way, is a is overall an excellent study. There's a tremendous amount of very useful information in there. I don't agree with its conclusion, but the information and data contained therein are remarkably beneficial and helpful. 
So I did a calculation based on um, some sediment that was sequestered early on in the existence of the old Duluth Public Pier. It no longer exists. It was removed by a storm, but it was present for a few years early on, about the same time that we built the Duluth uh, Ship Canal. And by looking at the amount of sediment sequestered there, I can play the same game that I play on the South Rim and come up with a sediment supply. That's one way. The other way I can do it is I can say, all right, this Minnesota point, when I look at it, it's homogeneous, it's uh, homogeneous in its structure, it's smooth. All the evidence suggests that this feature built out and continues to build out in a smooth, uniform way. So then I can say, all right, if that's going to work, if that if that if that's true, then I can basically take the length of this point and create a fraction. This is this is high tech said sediment transport here. I can create a, a fraction that tells me basically these sediment supplies are proportional to the length of the barrier that is fed by either source. So if I do that, I come up with a ratio of about eight to two, and that gives me a sediment supply from the, from the North Shore of about 6,000 cubic meters, which is comparable to 8,000 cubic meters, right? So the point here is that there's a significant sediment supply probably coming from the North Shore. And this sketch that I made, that's the stagnation point. That's a very conservative estimate that's based on where the gravel was no longer present. There's also sand coming down from the North Shore, and that sand would be deposited down to a further point. So this stagnation point, the zero flux boundary should probably move down here a little bit. Okay. All right, real quick, two slides. What are the, so we have this intractable problem. What are the possible solutions? This matrix is put together by the core, and it basically highlights five scenarios. The first one being a bypassing plant. In other words, you would take sediment. This is particularly relevant to the south shore or to the south end, to the superior entry. Take sediment from Wisconsin, feed it across the uh, entryway to Minnesota. Beach nourishment. We're already doing that. Maybe we'll continue to do that. There are benefits to this. It's 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 a viable solution. Constructing dunes, offshore submerged reefs, or finally remove the federal structure, which would take away the harbor, which is not going to happen. Right. All right. It's my last slide. This is my harebrained idea. I almost, almost hesitate to state it publicly, but thought about it for a long time, and I guess sealing my fate right here. <laughs> All right. So if the idea of a stagnation point is true. And I think all the evidence points to it. Then, if we could locate that stagnation point with some not too sensitive degree of certainty, that's the point to locate some jetties. In other words, build a new entryway. It's, of course, extremely costly. But at what point do you start adding up, you know, the nickel and diming to death over decades and centuries and fight the bullet and make a big investment. That would be followed by progressive uh, you know, decommissioning and removal of both the Duluth and the superior entries. So the current location of these entries is literally a worst case scenario for sediment tracking on Minnesota Point. You're not just cutting off the river of sand at one location, you're cutting it off basically two locations. Okay. And you're leaving this entire inner, pier, inner region sorry. This scenario would essentially, if you do it right, would allow that sediment to be deposited as it naturally wants to from the south shore source and from the north shore source. And by the time the sediment flux gets to that node, it's very small. So you're not start, you're not starving anybody in that in that strategy. Okay, that's it. <laughs> On that note, we have time for a few. Sure, questions. No questions. All right, great. Yeah. Round penetrating radar. So the idea is this straight out of uh, what's the um, 
TV show, CSI. <laughs> Use it to image features in the subsurface using acoustic energy. Tends to penetrate fairly, have perfect shallow penetration depths. You can't come down very deep, but it's nice for things like this. Why, why use fine grain in, in the deep version and not for the grain sand? The fine grain sand is what's available. And there's a there's actually a very nice symbiosis that takes place right now between the dredging that has to be done in the harbor, and that material needs to be put somewhere. And if it can be used for beach nourishment, that's a that's a win-win situation with the caveat of the green side. So I'm going to ask you to repeat questions okay, for so. our, so. our colleagues online. In the beach nourishment trend, are you concerned about legacy contaminants that are being bent up and then dumped on a public facing beach? So the, the question involves uh, the potential for unpleasant materials from the harbor to be deposited on the beach and uh yes that is that is a potential issue however the core has tried to do a very very good job of making sure that only clean sediment is routed to the to the lakeshore side there have been some some glitches in that um and there's it's a fairly contentious issue i don't really i'm not in a position to have a a meaningful uh comment on that other than yes maybe I have an online question for you. Um, the sediment trapped by Minnesota Power's hydro system dams also contribute to the sediment reduction. Ah, that's a really good question. So the, the question is, uh, basically, the Minnesota Power has dammed the St. Louis River at like four or five locations upstream. And is that cutting off the sediment supply coming from the St. Louis River? The short answer is no. They are capturing, the dams are capturing sediment, but the amount of sediment that's being captured was not getting to Minnesota Point anyway. If you want to see evidence of that, uh, you open up Google Earth and you look at the St. Louis River just a little bit upstream of Fond du Lac. And you will see in the river a very interesting feature. It looks like a, it looks like a, a crow's foot, three fingers. And that is basically what's called a bayhead delta. So that is where the sand fraction in the St. Louis was being deposited before the dams were built. Why is it all being deposited so far upstream? Because the river has been flooded. So it's formed an estuary and sand, coarse grain sand at least, by and large is not getting down uh, to the area of interest before the dams were put in place. It's a good question. Um, another online question. Um, if the existing transport amount coming from South Shore is approximately or almost enough sediment to keep the point from drowning now, I'm wondering how it is that there is so much erosion on the south end of the point. Uh, by south end, I, I, I'm assuming that means just across the, across the entryway. Um, so the reason there's so much erosion there is because you basically have literally put a dam in the way of the river of sediment that's moving along the coast. So the system responds, the waves don't go away. Those waves continue to act on the coastline just across the entryway and they get the sediment that they can carry. They pilfer it from the beach. That's why there's so much erosion. there. And if that process continues for probably another 50, 60, 70 years, in principle, at least, you could breach the barrier there. That will never happen because it won't be allowed to happen, but that would be where a breach would first occur. If, if we neglected it. If we neglected it, that's correct. Jules? I'm curious, there's certain areas that are like threshold levels of responsibility in terms of how much erosion happens before responsibility is claimed. Is that outlined? And then so to your first question, can you, can you oh, I'm sorry, the question, I'll probably butcher it, but is there a, is there a threshold for culpability? I'm assuming you're referring to the Corps of Engineers. Yeah. And then the second question is, what's the long-term prognosis for beach nourishment? So with respect to the first question, I'm not aware of the inner workings of the Section 111 culpability quantification. I don't I don't know how that sausage is made. 
Um, I'm imagining it's a pretty rigorous approach. Uh, with respect to your second question, I, I just off the top of my head, I don't see a uh, obvious endpoint for beach nourishment. If if that if the if folks decide that that's the path forward, um, there certainly will continue to be a source of sediment, dredge spoils. So um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. If again, if that's the path people want to go. I'm going to take one more online question. Um, have you examined the core's new modeling assumptions and data inputs? And if so, are you confident this work will be useful? I have not had any access to the core's model assumptions or model itself. I don't think that they are at that point yet. I think they are still sussing out the uh, who's going to do the modeling, et cetera. So um, at some point, we will, of course, get to see that because the study will be published, but that's probably a few years off in the future is my guess. And I'll reserve one question for myself, and that's what academic involvement is there in studying these issues? So are is money coming to academia from the Army Corps or other funding sources? Um, or is, this, or is this a sore topic? No, no, no. It's no. <laughs> Was I grimacing? <laughs> no, it's funding fine. always is a sore topic. Yeah. Um, the core generally operates as a, as a relatively closed shop. It's not because they're being exclusive. It's just because it's very difficult for them to transfer money outside of their... Um, outside of their but, but they hire Baird. They do. Um, so Baird is a private consulting firm and the specialization in that field. Um, long story short, um, Andy, are you getting any? I'm not getting any. No, no. So, uh, okay. The, in terms of other academics being involved, you know, we've Andy and Harry and I and Karen, we've been working kind of on the sediment transport side, the sort of longer term, you know, bouncing into the geology side of things. I'm not aware of. UMD academics, like in the engineering department, that are doing any sort of okay. engineering. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a comment or a possible question about, you know, I really question the significance of fine grain sand versus coarse grain sand and how much truly different is it. So, much of that sand is being dredged from the harbor in those striations that you pointed out at the beginning. Which water natural, natural way. I mean, for beach nourishment, that's the area they generally focus on because it's good clean. And then, okay, so even if it were a finer grain sand, we're talking about waves that move two foot stones. Yes. And so, you know, whether it's a you know a fraction of a millimeter larger or smaller grain of sand, I don't know how much that matters. In the big picture of things. Okay. And, and are other things playing into that movement of sand? But if you take pictures of where there's beach grass, that sand doesn't move, or it doesn't move near as much as where the beach grass has been created. Correct. So that's a lot of questions. Can you can you summarize that real quick? Uh, I, <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I can't. Uh, you, you want me to go in reverse order? I'll, I'll go with the first the first one, which is a, which is a really good question. Is how and I'll sort of stop me if I'm yeah, ruining yeah. this. Um, how different is fine grain sand? So let's say 100 micron sand with, versus 400, 500 micron sand, coarser sand, um, given that the wave energy available can move all of it. And the answer to that is that the finer grain sediment is mobilized under more conditions. So in the, the idea of you don't need as big of a storm to mobilize it as you do with the coarse grain material. So therefore it's going, even though um, the largest storms will mobilize all of it, a smaller storm will mobilize the finer grain material more easily. So effectively the light switch is on more yeah. of the time with respect to transport than it is with the coarse grain stuff where you really do need the large events to drive. The other issue with the fine grain material is that it's mobilized easily by wind. 
And one thing to keep in, in the back of your mind is when you look at a barrier, and this is actually very true on Minnesota Point, um, the fine grain component gets blown to the back and actually helps to offset, it, it helps to keep the, the base side of the barrier alive to some extent. So when you vegetate everything to hold down that fine grain component, in a way you are short circuiting some of nature's methods of getting sediment to the backside of the, of the barrier. Um, I think in terms of real world day-to-day -day implications, as you are well aware, some of the residents on the north end are not particularly happy because after beach nourishment, their yards are full of sand, a aeolian or wind-driven sand, fine green stuff. Um, so, well, cobble was there, right? So that, that's another point since you brought it up, I'll just mention it real quickly. We hear a lot about dune restoration, et cetera. And I, I certainly have no problem with dune restoration to be very clear, but in the original arrangement, of Minnesota Point, 1861, before we did anything to it, so to speak. Obviously, I wasn't there at the time, but um, based on what I know about, <laughs> although you might guess otherwise based on our technology skills here, um, long story short, there, it's highly unlikely there were any dunes on the north. Why? Because it was gravel and cobbles. And you can't build aeolian dunes with, with gravel. So, doesn't mean that they're a bad thing, just that if you really want to, you know, get back to the way it was, that that's not the way it was. Yeah. I feel like I left something on grass. One last comment. Grass is great. Using your same argument before, grass has no ability to withstand direct wave attack. It's just the grass limit is basically showing you the limit of wave warm-up during a given event. And then if you watch through time, Say you have a very, very large event, grass line goes up, wait a couple of years, that grass line will migrate back down until the next event, large event comes along and gobbles it up. Any last thoughts? Sorry to keep you guys long. I apologize. But thank you for your questions. Great. I'm going to call it there. That's Thanks, John. I really yeah. appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. And thanks to everyone online. We're going to sign off now. <laughs> yeah, the, I think we should make sure to not confuse our shitty phones. Um.